Good evening, and welcome to the Pioneer Power Showgrounds and our gathering in the Pancake House. On behalf of the New Prague Historical Society, Fred Simon, President, Dennis Dvorak, and the entire committee, we are glad that you could join us this evening in a discussion and open forum on St. Thomas and Darien Township history. Dan Callahan will be leading the discussion and welcomes all to join in with their stories of the unique history of this area. As you can see, I'm not just an ordinary little old tractor up on a couple of poles. I am here to welcome all who come to visit either to our swap meet or the Pioneer Power Show itself. Some of you have probably seen my relatives wandering in the field slowly but surely. I am a W.C. Alice Chalmers that was made in West Allis, Wisconsin. There are many just like me that served the area farmers in the mid-30s and have helped many farmers complete their field work. You might have even seen Big Gene, Ray O'Connell, or Tony Pianco roaming slowly around in their fields with some of my relatives from time to time. I am here to help you, to guide you, and most of all, to watch you as you enjoy your time here. In about 90 days from now, there will be the Pioneer Power 50th anniversary show on August 25th, 26th, and 27th of this year. Please come and join us and have fun day and afternoon. You can dine in the Thresher's Kitchen or right here in the Pancake House. There will be many food vendors as well that will be here to please your palate. I'll be looking for you. Hope to see you then, and thank you. And now for the correction. I am Anur Alice Chalmers, and that was an old uncle of mine from almost 90 years ago. He has been up on those poles for almost 30 years. He's out of gas, his check engine light, never came on because there isn't one. So you don't always believe everything he says. So this presentation will be modified slightly. As Dan and we all know, St. Thomas Parish was on the western edge of Darien Township, very close to Tyrone Township. So we must not forget that most of the settlers that settled in this area that established this church were from these parts of Leeser County. They were mostly all of Irish descent. There were many other settlers and people of Catholic faith that attended this church over many years of its existence. And now on with the show. Thank you very much and hang in there. Next is a public service announcement and it's very important. Credence, by the way. And Dan wanted to, me to tell you there's actually two biffs on the north side of this building. They're not the best. If you should run out of toilet paper, I think Dan brought a couple extra rolls along. He makes apologies that there aren't any service catalogs out there because I don't even know if they make them anymore. As far as some of the young lads that asked about facilities, It'll be up to them to use their imagination, and that's all I'm going to say about that. That kind of sets the table, and uh, we're going to keep it light. Next slide. At first, I'm going to talk about the reasons that the people came here. There was a feudal system in Europe no matter if you're from continental Europe or the British Isles, you didn't own a damn thing. The prince or the leader or the man owned the property. He owned you. So you worked for them, you didn't own the land, and if they decide they need to conscript your young men and take them off to war, they did it. And if they kind of fancied the younger women, they took them too. 
That's how it went. So people were oppressed, they were downtrodden, and they were looking for a way out. This whole thing started about the mid-1600s. About that time, there was a revolution in Ireland, don't you know? It was about 1640. Henry VIII wanted to get married a couple more times, so he formed his own religion, and that was the Church of England, Anglican. They didn't like Catholics. Nothing against anybody here that's not Catholic. They did not like Catholics. In fact, they hated them. They would just as soon kill them or get rid of them. They didn't want them at all. So there was a revolution in Ireland. And there was a guy named Cromwell that was sent to put down the revolution. He ended up killing many, many Irishmen, many. And then he pushed the rest of them out to the west part of Ireland to starve, to catch diseases and whatever. He actually deported 50,000 Irish. 10,000 of them were young children, orphans. He sent some of the orphans to the Caribbean to be indentured servants or slaves, and they were slaves. So that's what happened then. We're going to fast forward 200 years, and that's about the time of the famine. What a lot of people don't know is that the potato came from South America, as did corn from the Americas, as did tobacco from the Americans. The Spanish gave the Native Americans the horse. They got loose, multiplied. So the Native Americans before the Spanish came did not know what a horse was. They knew what a buffalo was. But then they had horses. And with the early settlers, or conquerors, they brought disease as well. So the potatoes flourished in Ireland and all over Europe. The Polish came up with a neat recipe. They made vodka, and they had a good time. The Irish ate a lot of potatoes. It was a staple, and it ended up they raised big families. They didn't have much. Like I said, they didn't even own what they had. They might have had stone and sod and a thatched roof and they ate potatoes, and they had big families. But the crop failed, they had a blight, and it was all over Europe as well. So people were starving to death. Uh, the Irish especially, they lost a million people because the British weren't feeding them and they could have cared less. So about 100,000 came to this country every year, and they traveled via boats, so go to the next slide. And they were looking for an opportunity to get here, and they heard there was free land. They knew the treaties were made, and there hadn't been any uh, thing after the Civil War given yet. But the treaties were made, and they knew there was going to be some land that they could have. You can imagine somebody working in a principality, having a little pot of ground, and having to give better than half to the landlord. And if he needed more, he just took it or give whatever, so you didn't really own it. They kicked you off the land. Ireland, they burnt the houses and pushed them out. They tried to destroy the religion because they wanted everybody to be Anglican, just like good old Henry. So they came here. Keep going. That's intentionally like playing. That's me. That's, that's the story of my life. Okay. They, they taxed and they pushed people off the land. They took their houses, they burnt their houses. They just threw them out, they could have cared less. So many of them, like I say, died along the road. Keep going. They lived in shanties like this. They didn't have any logs because there weren't any trees. Now down in Europe, they had logs. They knew how to build log cabins, so they helped when the settlers got here. These guys didn't know, they had some potatoes, maybe a cow, a couple chickens, maybe. And uh, they lived very simple lives in a one-room home with maybe a cow out back, if they were lucky, one more. They came on what was called coffin ships. Now these ships took people from Africa, slaves, they took prisoners, they took people from continental Europe and Ireland. The ships weren't too seaworthy. This is before the steam power got onto the ships because they had to carry too much coal and they weren't fuel efficient. So it was cheaper to go by sail, it really was. Coming down here today, I happened to look at a tree, I'll get to it, 
It was on the Duane property where the creek is right before you get to the St. Thomas turn. And it's a Siberian spruce and the leaves on the boughs are like this. It reminded me of a sailing ship. I gotta say it, it looked a lot like one. These ships were about 175 feet long. They were 28 to 30 feet across. No bigger than a double wide times 10 or 12. They fit about 300 people below decks. They called it steerage. They were just pushed down there. There was no sanitation. There was very little food, and it depended on the benevolence of the ship captain whether he was going to feed them at all. So they suffered. They lost about 30% in root. Uh, some of the families wanted a proper burial, so they tried to stash those that died and wrap them up. But that couldn't happen. You can imagine how bad it was. I mean, you're, you're, you're going in a bucket and you're trying to eat. And uh, the ship captain and crew said, you can't keep them here. So they dumped them overside. Sharks followed the ships. I don't need to say any more about that. They got to this country, and some of them had been loaded down with typhus and other diseases. They wouldn't let them off the ships. They would not let them off the ships. Well, I'll show you. That's what it looked like. This is steerage. It looked like something in Dachau. That's what it would remind you of. And uh, they tried to keep cheerful as much as they could, but you can see a lot of them are downtrodden. But at least they're getting the hell out and they're coming to this country and they think to a new life. Doctor checked them out. You're sick, you're sick. I gotta tell you a little story about my relatives. I'm related to the Fays from St. Peter. Her name was Jane Fay. She had six kids. She came out with a famine. She lost her husband to typhus. She made it all the way to San Francisco with six children. You can imagine how they traveled. One of her sons came back to St. Peter. He married some Irish gal on the road and went to St. Peter. So that's how that went. So they got here and they knew what they faced, but when they, before they got here, it was a bad time in politics. The Whigs were running the country and they also hated the Irish. They looked at them as dirty, filthy people and by God, they were Catholic, so they hated them even more. So they met with a lot of opposition, a lot of angst. And again, they pushed him into slums. Again, disease and pandemic came in. And some of the Europeans experienced the same thing. So it wasn't a good time, but they knew there was stuff open. They knew there was gonna be land and they knew there was gonna be a better future. So westward hole they went. They traveled via a canal system. You all heard about the Erie Canal. There's songs about it. That was built in 1825. A lot of uh, immigrants helped dig it. But you can see you can get off in New York, go up the Hudson to Albany, hang a, a left, I guess it would be, go down the New York Canal, Lake Erie, and end up down on the Ohio River and eventually the Mississippi. Some people got lost along the way. Brothers got split up. They never saw them again. There's one hollering family. One got here. He didn't know where his brother ended up. Same thing happened a generation later with some of the Yurok's in New Prague. They ended up in Cedar Rapids, but they just discovered them about 20, 30 years ago. They never knew they were there. They knew a brother left someplace. The other way they traveled was by rail, but the rail system wasn't that good. The rail system maybe got about as far as uh, maybe Dubuque, something like that, or Chicago. So most of them had to walk via oxen or a wagon train or something like that just to get here. Railroads, they weren't the best way to get here. All right. When they settled, they found a lot of good land that they could get into. Uh, this is Derry, Maine, and I'll just go over where they settled. Uh, go to the next slide, then we'll come back to this one. That's the top. Is that, is that Tyrone? Yeah, that's Tyrone. Go to the next slide. Okay. You, you can see across the top there, this is right along the county line, about mile marker 144. My relative, John O'Callaghan, was a great, great uncle. But I discovered lately there was a Thomas Callahan right south of him. You go south, you come to the Sharkies. 
Then you go south a little bit more and you come to the Cary Patch where the Sullivans, there are four or five brothers and a cousin that settled. Then you can see the other names fill in. Donahue, all the way down, more Sullivans, Hanlons, and a whole bunch of names I can't mention them all. And yes, there was a Denaher there. And some of you watched The Quiet Man. There was a Denaher that's buried at St. Thomas. Must have been quite a guy. I don't think he's played John Wayne. But anyway, um, so go back to the other slide. Sorry, that's Tyrone, there you go. And, and some of them settled around St. Thomas. And then you can see later on, it's the Browns, the Shays, the O'Connells, some Thorntons and all that. But interdispersed in that, you go to Eastern Dairy Name, right around Ruland's Corner, you see your Wires, your Bowers, Howers, Giesens, and all that. And they settled Union Hill, that was covered earlier. But then you go further east and you see your Bone Socks, your Slaughterhouse, all part of the Lanesburg Church. So they all came about the same time, initially they did. And uh, they seemed to get along. Then let's go to Tyrone, back to Tyrone Township. Tyrone on the eastern part is where a lot of them settled, and those are your O'Neills, your Doherty's, your Burns's, and all of them settled in there. And there was a Bauer family, there was a Meyer family and everything. I'll get to it a little bit later, but I gotta tell you a story about the Meyers. A fellow came to my door the other night. His name was Bruce O'Malley. He says, I'm Irish, but I'm mostly German. Now, what Irishman would admit that? <laughs> He was, he was a good guy and we agreed on a lot of things. And he brought me four or five pages about his relative that was Jim Meyer that came from Germany. And he had a sister that was married to a Bauer about three miles south and west of St. Thomas. They had a shack, that's what it was, with a dirt floor and bark roof that the snakes got in. So he got to Dubuque, but he needed money to go further. And this is a plight by a lot of people that got here. So he finally saved up the money to go to visit his sister. And I think the brother-in-law gave him 80 acres. He said, I can't handle this winter. There's no jobs up here. So he goes all the way to New Orleans. And he stays there for about five or six years. Then he finds a nice German lady from Baden. And they ended up coming up here and they got married at the St. Thomas Church by a German priest, you know. So they were happy and that, that's the root of the Meyer family that's there. And there was, the guys ran the implement dealership in town. I knew Clem, I knew Ardo, and one of the great granddaughters is here. So it's quite a story when you get into it. He gave me, he says, I don't care if you say this or not, because he's my kind of guy, here, take it, whatever. But it's an interesting story, and it, it talks about just about what could have happened with anybody. That's kind of how it was with a lot of settlers, how they got here. And that's why I emphasize that family. But these families that got here multiplied. There was a Brown, I think his name was Tom. He had 15 children, and 10 of them were boys. 10. A lot of people here have relations that are intertwined back and forth. And they know. My, I mentioned to young Gernscheid in the back, my great great grandmother was from St. Henry. She was Margaret Gernscheid. And uh, I found that out. And some say, You're kidding. I said, No, I'm not. And she's buried at St. Henry, right next to her husband, who was Victor Hange. So I, I know some of the lineage there. A lot of you have done some genealogy and going back and finding. It's especially easy when you get into Europe and you look that way. I know Bar Boys and Danny's wife, one of his daughters, checked the Polish thing. They went back hundreds of years in Poland. She's got a huge thing. Germans, some of the Germans have too. They went to Germany and their wires relatives ran a, 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 a winer, wine thing. With the Irish, it's different because they burnt the churches where the records were, they were moldy. So we kind of run into a brick wall when we try to go back there and find our ancestors. It's, it's damn tough, I'll put it that way. Okay, that's enough about that. I could go on all night, but I won't. Uh, they had a real strong faith. And the first church was built in section 22 of Derrynane Township by German and Irish. 
there is Widmer, Eason, G-U-E-S-S-E-N, and a cup, and his son became a priest. There were a lot of other Irish families that formed that church. It was a small log church, and the map will show where it was. That kind of explains where it is, and they built a church out of logs. That's what it might have looked like. It's a rendition. But it sits right there, just off of County 32 that's been blacked up. Thank you, Art Hayes. And uh, that's where the cemetery is. And there's an aerial photograph we have as well. That uh, piece of property is owned by Andy Mager. It was Chubb Mager's uh, nephew. I, I knew them both very well. And Chubb used to tell me about that cemetery up there. There are about 22 settlers buried. The church was actually there for probably five, six years. And then it was used for some other outbuilding by the farmers. So that's how that ended up. And at the same time, I looked at a couple other churches. A lot of churches were established in 1857. They started out as log and then frame churches, but a lot of them did that. A lot of them started about the same time. And there were other denominations as well. Lanesburg Church. You go up on Highway 19, that's where some of the Maltzes and, and Crances and all them lived. They had their Protestant church right on 19. Okay, next slide. They came to the big woods and they settled. It was a big swale of people that I said that came down from Shakopee all the way down. It was through Belle Plaine, through here, through the center, through Waterville, Wasika, and on. And it was a big swale of Irish and other settlers, like I mentioned earlier, the Germans and the Irish got here about the same time. That's about the big woods. The trees were huge. The rivers were not polluted. That's why they were navigable. There weren't a bunch of dead branches or trees. The environmentalists were not saying, don't cut the trees. You might kill this mouse. So anyway, <laughs> what, what happened was the rivers weren't polluted. The rivers didn't have a bunch of snags and stuff. There wasn't a whole lot of silt washed in because the woods were right up to the edge. So they were navigable. One of the Hollerans actually worked on a steamboat. He was the ancestor of all the Hollerans here. And he worked on a steamboat for several years and decided to think about farm in there again. Okay. They lived together. They had a commonality of experiences, like I mentioned earlier. There were artisans that came from Europe. Not that the Irish didn't have that. They liked to talk and sing and all that. But as far as practical application and how to build a log cabin, you saw what I showed you. They could build a little shanty out of mud and sod and thatch. But some of the people coming from Central Europe, they had skills. They were blacksmiths. They did this, they did that in support of the, the landlord. So they, they knew how to build things. So, they had a commonality, they had a common purpose. A lot of them had a common religion, and they stuck together and they worked together very, very hard. This guy's gonna talk a little bit. This is our guest speaker from Florida, and please listen. Some of you know who I am. I have been known as Honest Abe. I was just a farm boy that rose to prominence and did good things for our country. I survived the Civil War but did not last long after that compliments of Mr. Booth. I was a president that made the Homestead Act that gave many settlers a free quarter section of land to live on, raise their families, and work. Some of you may have seen me in the Hall of the Presidents on the Disney properties. It is there with 45 other former presidents where I now reside. I do want to tell you how important it is to remember your history, be proud of what happened, be proud of how your forebears worked to make this country what it is today. A wonderful place to live and grow your families. Please, as you leave today, remember to preserve our history, learn from it, and do not try to change it or modify it just to suit whichever way the political winds happen to be blowing. Thank you for coming today. 
remember your history, speak truthfully, and above all, keep the faith. God bless you all, and God bless America. The, uh, the Civil War was fought, and it was a tough one. They didn't have medevac choppers. They didn't have much medicine. If you got wounded a little bit, you might have lost a leg. You might have just died on the battlefield. They couldn't get you out, so it was tough. We've got some Civil War vets that are buried out at St. Thomas Cemetery. They did not shirk their responsibility. They went. They did what was needed. The other thing I'm going to talk about is the Indian uprising. There was uh, a little problem. The Sioux Nation calls it a war. We call it an uprising. But some of you understand what happened. They kind of lied to them. They took part of the property. Then they took it away. Then they did this, that, and the other thing, and they said, too bad, you're going to live here. And it didn't go well. And there was a lot of festering going on. I know how I would have felt. Maybe what I would have done. I don't know. But it wasn't really done properly. It wasn't done fairly. So during this conflict, 600 settlers were killed. 100 Sioux were killed. And there was an obelisk downtown Mankato. I remember seeing it when I was a kid. 38. This is the site where 38 Sioux. They finally got rid of it. But I remember that as a kid because coming from St. Thomas to go to Mankato, that was a big deal. And I said, what's this? Well, that's where they hung them Indian. Okay, fine. There were three guys that went, I think one name was an Aarons, one was a Lusky, and I forget the other fellow's name. They lived down on the Leeser Creek uh, in section 20, known at 29 of Tyrone, I'm trying to say one or the other. And they ended up um, fighting with the Leeser Tigers. All three of them got killed. Uh, Mr. Aarons is buried at the St. Thomas Cemetery. Mr. Lusky in the sewer. Mr. Aarons left 13 children, and his wife was a Foley, and a lot of Foley's around the sewer. She decided to pull up stakes and move to Dakota Territory. So it was not a good time. There was also a Mrs. Witt from, uh, <laughs> actually from Union Hill that got killed. Yeah, in the it's, it's actually a relative of mine, and I've done a ton of research on this, mm -hmm. so um, my third great grandfather's name was Carl Witt, and they lived down by Morton, Minnesota, yep. and his yep. um, second wife was um, named Frederica. She was the one that was shot and killed, mm -hmm. and then he relocated to the Union Hill area. He mm -hmm. brought with him his four children that he had had um, out in that in the Morton area. They settled in Union Hill. Mm -hmm. My second great grandfather was Herman Charles Carl Witt. He was eight years old, and he was shot twice—once in the hip and once in the head. Uh, they escaped to Fort Ridgely. Uh, they all survived. They all settled here in. Union Hill, um, and then he married a Spachens, I believe was her name, mm -hmm. and they had a farm um, on the Scott County side of, of, of 19. They're all buried in the Union Hill Cemetery, mm -hmm. and my great-grandfather, Joseph Witt, uh, was the son of, of Herman Charles Carl, and I've done a lot of research on this, and so it's, it's an incredible story if yeah. you really uh, dig deep into what these settlers endured during that time. Thank you. I, I did not know that. If anybody else wants to share anything, please do. That was very interesting. I appreciate that. And there's a lot of people that have done research on their families. It was a tough time. It was a difficult time, but uh, the settlers got over it. I'm not so sure that the tribal members did. Recently, the benevolent state of Minnesota has decided to give back to the Upper Sioux uh, there's a state park. It's 1,300 acres, right at, they call it the confluence of the Yellow Medicine River and the Minnesota River. It isn't a very well attended state park, so they said they're going to give it to the Native Americans out in Morton so that they can do what they want with it. And this is where some of the battles were waged. It was uh, kind of a bloody, bloody site. Okay, next slide. Uh, I would recommend this book. I read it. I shared it with my brother Hibernians. It's very interesting. 
about how Lincoln interacted with the Irish in the Civil War. I don't read much, as you know, I just talk. So what it is is it's about the Civil War, and there were two bishops. One was Hughes out of New York. The other one was in Charleston. They were both recruiting in Ireland for troops to fight the Civil War, give them free passage. Hughes is a little more conservative. The guy down in Charleston had a little looser interpretation of Catholicism, of course. So they were both recruiting in Ireland, and they brought him back here to go fight. So it's a good book, just, just something. I, I don't really uh, recommend stuff, but this was a good one. Okay. Um, these are some of the original people that formed the church. I mentioned earlier that other people from other countries attended this church initially and over the years. The first group, I think there was a Conley in there that went to the archdiocese to form the church. And this church was about 1857, a log church, then a frame church, and then the church we all know and love. But you can see the names, Conley, Courtney, O'Connell, O'Leary, Reardon, Reagan, Ronan, it's Ronane, Tim Shea, he's pretty prominent, Daniel Sullivan, Jeremiah, and all that. So they're all there. All right, next slide. Okay, the church will speak to you. Good evening. I am the St. Thomas Church that served this Catholic community of Derrynane and Tyrone Township. I was built in 1883 and have been here for a long time. I was built on the edge of a beautiful shallow lake, which is now a marsh. This parish was established in 1858. There was a log church and then a frame church that preceded me on this very spot. It was mentioned that the Sullivans to the north in the Cary Patch wanted the church to be built farther north in their neck of the woods. The majority of settlers wanted a site more centrally located, so here I am. All around me is a cemetery in which many of my former parishioners have been laid to rest. I have had many baptisms, weddings, and funerals that were performed within these walls. Many priests have preached from the pulpit. I have been here for a long time and have served this community well and kept the faith for all of my parishioners. My church grounds and the cemetery are meticulously maintained by Dick O'Connell. He does an excellent job. I hope to remain on this spot and occasionally serve this community with a church service or funerals that are held inside of me. Thank you. Okay. Now this is about the school. The school is going to talk. Some of you heard this before, but Schools were equally as important as churches. A lot of the schools initially were held in houses where they could fit them in. They built schools, maybe of logs at first, but this is the one I'm most familiar with, and it'll tell a little story for you. It won't be long, the one that's located right here. In Derrynane Township, there were five schools. St. Thomas had about 50 kids. There was one near Shea Lake temporarily. There was one just past Heidelberg on 28. I think somebody made it into a house. There was a Sharkey school where my grandmother taught. But many of you have had relatives that taught at these schools over the years. And there, there's a list of them later on, so roll the school. So I will get the heat going. Good evening and welcome. I am a one room school that was located in section 16 of Derrynane Township in northern Leeser County, Minnesota. The land that I was built on in 
1886 was deeded to the school district 107. Edward and Elizabeth Holler owned the farm where I was located, so I was referred to as the Holler in School. Many children were taught inside of me, and many teachers taught at this school and many other schools throughout the county. Children from the local area went to school here until 1959, when my district was closed and consolidated to New Prague and other towns nearby. After my precious children left, I was used as a 4-H meeting place and mostly just an empty building after that. I was moved to Pioneer Power Showgrounds in 1986. That makes me 125 years old now. I believe that this will be my new and permanent home. The Birds Girls, Lonnie and Diane, are the caretakers and curators of this building that I occupy. They clean, do windows, and tidy up the grounds before the Pioneer Power Show. Please plan to visit and hear some of the stories and how these treasured learning places help many children during a simpler time. Thank you. This is the St. Thomas School. They had as many as 50 students there. They covered a wide area. Uh, a lot of people can relate. I think the first school burnt, then they built another one, then another one. And the latter one was used for town board meetings. Keep going. These are a list of some of the teachers. You can see some names are familiar. Anna Mae Shaughnessy, Richard Siminski, uh, Marietta Moore, Marietta Sharkey. Uh, the one I want to point out is uh, Frances Beckman. Two of her great-grandchildren are teachers in New Prague in the area and they teach kids. So they're her great-great-great-grandchildren as a couple of mine are from their great-grandmother. So it, it kind of filters down and they all have a purpose, but these are just some of the earlier teachers. You'll see there's a couple of Riardis up there. Uh, they had men teachers a lot of times uh, before the Civil War broke out and they were swept up into the conflict. Okay. This is another message, but before we start this, I want to emphasize this school is one of the only schools around that's preserved. Most of them were served for the farm. Most of them were made into houses. You won't see a school like this in too many places. This is rather unique for here. So you got to listen to the message. As I mentioned at the beginning, I am 125 years old. Like many of you, I have moved down the timeline and weathered many storms and bad times. My goals were met, and many students have went on to live successful lives and be patriotic citizens that have contributed to their community, state, and nation. As we all age, some of us have needed repairs, and I am no exception. I could use new siding. A beautiful new door to welcome those interested in me would be nice. New windows would be good as well. Lastly, to rid me of wasps that have attacked Diane Burns from time to time. After all that, I could use some nice, beautiful accent plants that would make me more attractive as well. Now I know that Pioneer Power will help in this process, but if anyone wants to help things along and donate, you are welcome to do just that. If you want to help, contact either of the Burns girls, Tom Graham, or the current president of Pioneer Power, Bill Thelman. This is not like a Save the School project at all. It is to make me look nice and attractive and a place where people want to enter and learn more about a one-room school. Thank you, and have a great day. Okay, it's intermission time after this. 
Uh, Dennis will talk about the orphans and how they got there and how they were received and what they did. So get up, mill around, go outside, and like I said, there's two biffs on the north side. Yeah, take about 10 minutes. It's good. And good evening. classroom management, if I use a teacher, and I, I never yell anymore, I just remain silent. Is that better? Is that better? Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. As I look over the audience and see all the hugging and the kissing, there must be some, some, there must be some family connections in this room. And uh, that's very gratifying that we can provide this uh, event for you. One thing that we, when we named the New Prague Historical Society, the New Prague Area Historical Society, it was for the purpose of celebrating different uh, parts of the community. We've done the German, we've done the Native American, and we certainly have done the Bohemian. So we thought about time, we should celebrate the Irish community. And so we want to celebrate with you and your history this evening. Dan Callahan has worked very hard on this uh, project, and I really commend him for doing this. Uh, he's, he hasn't uh, thrown in his 25 bucks to be, for membership yet, but he, <laughs> but he has supported us financially in many other projects, and it's been very uh, satisfactory and appreciated. The orphans that uh, I want to talk to you briefly about the, to this evening were sent uh, in 1896 from the Archdiocese in Boston to St. Paul. And I've been asked, were these the, or, the, the train orphans, the, the ones that boarded the trains and stopped at whistle stops, and the, where families and the children stopped out of the train and lined up and then smiled very affectionately and and straightened their dresses and straightened up and stood tall, hoping to be a, taken by a family to their home. It's a tragic story and it's just heartbreaking to think about this. However, these 30 children, 30 boys that were sent in 1896 um, were stopped in St. Paul and then through the coordination with a St. Thomas priest named Maurice Joy, uh, he brought them to the St. Thomas area. And this community, I think, was really special. And I, Linda O'Connell told me about this story when I met her at Coburn's one day and told her about what we we're hoping to have happen uh, in spring. And uh, orphans are, are a special part of my interest because for a couple of reasons. I had a piano student that came one day and she was crying. And I said, well, what's wrong, Ellen? She said, well, I asked my mother to find my biological mother. And the mother, her adopted mother became very upset. And I said, well, I can understand your perspective. You'd like to have an interest, there's a mystery that you'd like to solve. And I can understand how your adopted mother feels, maybe feeling rejected and maybe not accepted. But I said, be very careful what you decide to do because you may not like what you find. My father-in-law was an orphan. His mother died during the flu epidemic. And by definition, an orphan is someone that's up to the age of 18 whose parents have passed away. And navigating, navigating his history, my father-in-law's history, having been placed in homes and grandparent and that ended and then being placed at the same uh, in an orphanage where Cretan Durham Hall it all stands and being mistreated and having to navigate the dynamics of, of other children and the language barriers that they uh, were, ne had, were confronted with and ended up in um, foster homes. Now the foster home system did not begin until 1929 in, in full earnest. Children were kind of a victim victims of what might happen, just anything that could possibly happen. And in my father-in-law's case, the foster homes did not prove to be um, good. 
he ended up in New Prague and was adopted as a, just essentially as a workhorse. People just, they were childless and he was, he fulfilled that need for an extra pair of hands. Between 1884 and 1929, 150 to 250,000 children were placed or relocated in America. Five to 6,000 children were sent to Minnesota between 1882 and 1892. Orphan trains are misleading. Many children were runaways from abusive homes, abandoned, escaping poverty, ended up in charitable asylums, and escaping, or again, poverty, or were illegitimate. My wife and I met a young man from, actually he's not young anymore, but at Mankato Mayo today, and we got into a discussion, graduated from the Prague High School, and I asked him about his family and if he had any siblings. And he said, no, I was three months old when his mother died and his grandparents assumed his, uh, absorbed them into their home. I'm sure they were not young. I'm sure they were midlife or advancing of age. But nevertheless, these 30 um, orphans arrived, as I said, in 1896. And um, it's interesting in, in examining the St. Thomas uh, orphans that were provided in this uh, publication here. <clears throat> Some of you may have seen it or have access or possess one. So that's where I started. The interesting thing that I found was that there were so many, many other orphans brought into the St. Thomas area. And I thought, my gosh, this is a... It was a wonderful community that would take children. I do not remember this story being common in New Prague, in the Bohemian community. But the St. Thomas, uh, even though it was Catholic, both were Catholic communities, it was the St. Thomas community that really stepped forward to bring these children in, the, in their homes. Some of the children were adopted. Some assumed the adopted name of the family. Some in the census records that I used, uh, which was the by primary way of exploring this topic, were just listed as servants. Most of the children, as I looked through the genealogical sites of the Latter-day Saints, which is the Mormon genealogical site, um, they give some information, it's marginal, but by virtue of this Today's technology was able to find some interesting things. <clears throat> some of the orphans that I've found quite interesting were, excuse me, having a senior moment here, were the fact that, that today, in today's society, we often think of, of orphans as just being high, uh, celebrated. You know, we always think about our children being very special. And when I was teaching, I kind of decided, well, they ain't all special. But, I, but uh, most of them were born in Massachusetts, New York. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was the fact that I found one orphan who um, was listed as uh, being an inmate. And he was, uh, was Mr. Carr. And he was a laborer at the home of James Donovan. And um, he was in a reform school, and they did not indicate what he was there for, but his vocation was a wrestler. So he, he must have been trained in the area, and I am sure in the early days of St. Thomas, there were a lot, of, a lot of opportunities to wrestle with the schoolmates and so on. Uh, some of them enlisted in World War I. Some went on to be farmers. Some... Uh, just disappeared. And so the story ends and, and uh, some of them died very young. But it's a story that I found to be really heart-wrenching. And today when we think of orphans, we really often do not understand the complexity and the how many people were in this position, such as Babe Ruth, he was an orphan. Eleanor Roosevelt was an orphan. Now remember, up to the age of 18, with all parents, you're considered an orphan. Yes, she was born into a privileged family and married one of our presidents, but she was 
one of our more prominent orphans. Nancy Reagan was an orphan. Steve Jobs was an orphan. Nelson Mandela. And Simone Biles, the gymnast, was, a, was an orphan before she was adopted. So it, it, the orphans span a whole spectrum of experiences and stories. So what I'd like to leave you this, to, to with you this evening is to celebrate what this community did for young children. We do not know the history of it for each, student, each child, because as I said, they disappeared and were absorbed into the American landscape. But um, I like to think that they hopefully survived and were able to provide for themselves and their family. And uh, as I found out, they did serve and, and help to uh, bring the American dream come full circle. I did, public, I did print out um, the names of these orphans that I was researching and um, included in there are the story about Joe Holden's father, grandfather who was an orphan. He was Norwegian, ended up having two choices to come to Belle Plaine or Granite Falls. And he ended up in Belle Plaine and then ended up in the same Thomas, Thomas community and uh, has helped as a laborer in an area farm. And uh, Joe has uh, provided uh, lots of information and um, it, uh, I found that very interesting. In my handout I also have a little story that uh, Dan provided me was with one of the orphans that went on to become a member of the Minneapolis Fire Department and his name was Tom Cogland, C-O-E-G-H-L-I-N. And he was born in 1893, as well as most of these orphans were built, born, excuse me, around 1895, 1896, 1898, and came here as very young, young children. So the trauma, as you can imagine, uh, hopefully disappeared as they matured into adulthood. So I have them available up here. We did not expect this large of a gathering, and that is really uh, wonderful. I'd rather run out than not have enough. And uh, so please share these uh, with uh, family members or friends, and um, hopefully some of the names will trigger a memory. The generations that, have, that absorb these children are long gone, and no longer uh, are, uh, the stories have stopped. But uh, as I said, through the genealogical sites, we can continue. So again, thank you for coming this evening. I'll turn it over to Mr. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce uh, Mickey Sullivan. Don't let the name fool you. His grandmother was a retka. His mother was a traxler. He's a sharp kid. He's part of the Hibernians. You've seen him around Pioneer Power, he helps, and the St. Thomas Sportsman, some of the true things that he loves to do. He's going to talk a little bit about the Hibernians and a few other things. Here's me. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me get outside of the light there. All right, as uh, most of you know, my name is Mickey Sullivan. I live about a half mile north of St. Thomas. Um, I'm a descendant of the Cary Patch Sullivans, and um, just to correct you on one th minor detail, you said that there was four brothers and one cousin. There was actually seven brothers and one cousin. Oh so. my, thank you for that, I appreciate <laughs> that. A lot of Sullivans. So, yeah, so my, yeah, my family's been in the area since the 1850s, as far as I can tell, that was when they they were here before it was a, the, that Minnesota was a state. So, um, but today I'm here to talk about a couple different organizations that I'm a part of that have been in the area for well, one of 50 years and one 100 years. And the first one is the the Ancient Order of Hibernians. And the the history of the Hibernians goes all the way back to the 17th, and, the 18th and 19th centuries, as as Dan was talking about earlier. Uh, the Catholics were not, you know, they were. Oh, sorry, next. 
So the, the Catholics were persecuted in Ireland uh, very severely, and in response to that, there were several different organizations that, that formed as a result of that to try to protect the clergy, um, people who taught the faith in Ireland. Uh, one of them was the, the Defenders, and the other one was the Ribbon Men. And eventually, you know, and that was around the time of the, the penal laws that outlawed uh, the Catholics from owning land, from holding office, or even being able to vote at all. Uh, so eventually, the, as those laws were overturned and eased up, uh, the Hibernians became an organization in Ireland with a similar, uh, similar purpose. Even though they, you know, the laws were overturned, there was still a lot of uh, negative sentiment towards the, the, or the Catholics in Ireland. So the, these people were protecting the priests and the teachers and so on and so forth. Um, and eventually, in 1836, the Hibernians started in the United States, in New York City, the first chapter opened. And, and the, so that the United States group is, is separate from the group in Ireland. You know, there's uh, chapters in England, uh, Scotland, and in Canada as well. But the, the U.S. group is completely... Um, isolated from those groups they're not they're not intertwined at all um, and in the US our our group is significantly bigger than all of the other in all of the other countries so um, the in the national constitution the purpose of the organization was to promote friendship unity and Christian charity so that's you know one thing that we we live by as as a group and we try to promote that in everything we do um, and still, even even in the United States, where you know we had the you know, freedom of religion, there was still quite a bit of, of uh, you know negative sentiment towards Catholics and about the Irish in general. You know they weren't well liked in the early days, but so there was a little, still a little bit of the protecting the Catholic faith and the believers and the preachers of the faith. But there was in 1850, for example, there was. Uh, an anti-Catholic group, uh, political movement known at, called the, the Know Nothings. They tried to burn down the St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, and the, the Hibernians were instrumental in preventing that from actually happening. So even in, in the United States, they were working towards preservation of the, the sites that were important to the Irish Catholics. So then in the, in the early 1900s, there was kind of a shift in what the, the Hibernians were doing. They began doing a lot more, they, they became an insurance organization essentially. They were pooling the risk and they did uh, life insurance and in some cases I've seen instances of they were doing disability insurance. And I, in one of these booklets over here, the, the Church of St. Thomas, this one here, there's a picture of, of a, a local chapter that was doing that, and the names on there included Shaughnessy, Doyle, Halloran, Sharkey, O'Connell, Green, Sullivan, and Burns, and including my great-grandfather, Timothy C. Sullivan. He was, oh, there's right there is, is the picture. And so th that, was, that was one of the, uh, what prompted me to become a member was finding out that my great-grandfather was in that picture right there so but that you know eventually a lot of those members you know fell out of the group and that group disbanded but then in 1980 uh, there, there was a resurgence and in the Jessalyn area there was a new division formed uh, and the the big pushers for that were George Klusky and Dr. Patrick O'Keefe and then soon thereafter, there was a second division that was created, which was pushed by Greg O'Connell and Father James Burns. So there was, there was a lot of new members and, and a lot of new interest growing in that area. And so uh, uh, that's the current organization that, of which I'm the vice president is based, we, we're still based out of Jesselin, even though we did recently close down the church in, in Jesselin, sadly. So. Uh, we won't be able, you know, won't be able to have any masses there any longer. But, you know, one of the things that we, we we're no longer involved in the insurance game anymore. We're uh, our main 
Uh, our main projects include doing scholarships, marching in the St. Patrick's Day parades. Uh, we have a Founders Day the last, last Saturday of April every year. And we currently have about 95 members. And um, yeah, we, we have monthly meetings to, you know, to go over all of these things. And, and I think you know, Dan is one of our, one of our members, one of, one of our more vocal members, and we love having him there. And <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he's, he always keeps us very well informed, as, as, as you guys can tell, so. Uh, but that's, that's all I have on the, on the Hibernians. Does anybody else have anything to add or any questions from the crowd on that? I might add, we're looking for members. If you've got any Irish blood in you at all, come see us. We always are looking for new recruits, and there's one right in front of you. Because a lot of us are getting long in the tooth. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, so come come see us if you're interested, and, and we can we can get you set up. So. The other organi the other organization that I wanted to talk about is the the St. Thomas Sportsmen's Association. Uh, I wasn't able to find a whole lot of history on this one. I I didn't get it, get a hold of Jason in, in time, but um, it, it, it essentially started in 1968. Uh, it, the first thing that happened was there was a a, a, a snowmobile race that was coordinated by 15 or 20 different residents of the area. And it was kind of, it was a fundraiser situation. They wanted to raise funds to, uh, to have a, a space for the kids so that they didn't have to go to, you know, Belle Plaine or New Prague or Lisseur. They wanted their own space so that they could, so that they didn't have to shovel their kids all the way to, and when I was growing up, that was, we would all get on our bikes and just ride up to the ballpark. So that was, in 1968 was the first snowmobile races that they had. Um, and the, the first president of the organization was Bob Teagues. And before that, they, you know, the kids would gather around the township hall. Uh, and, you know, I don't imagine that, you know, there's not a whole lot of space there. So I can't imagine there's enough room to toss a ball around or anything like that. And there's certainly no playground equipment there. So, um, and two years later in 1970, the association purchased, uh, about 40 acres of land, which was partly made up of farmland and partly made up of lakes slash swamp land. <laughs> and there, it, the goal was to have a ball field and, and have a, a, a playground there, a legitimate playground for the kids to go to. And they, so they did build the, the ball field and they used an old chicken coop as the concession stand. talk about farmer ingenuity there. <laughs> and then two years after that, in 1972, uh, we started hosting softball tournaments, dances, and trap shoots, and you know, a whole bunch of different activities that we've been doing um, ever since then. So we still are, and you know, we still have done the tournament every year for, except for, you know, the COVID years, of course, but, um, but yeah, on, on, over the years we've added playground equipment, permanent bathrooms, volleyball and basketball courts. We currently have about 50 member families. We got a, we have an annual tournament that we still you know we've continued that tradition. Um, and some of these other traditions, like the trap shoots, we're trying to get going again. And um, you know, and this year we're also hosting the Lisur Youth Softball Girls 10U team. And so there's going to be a lot of activity up this summer and. And was it 2018? We celebrated our 50-year anniversary, so we've been been going strong ever since. And I think you know we've we've got a lot more going on this summer. And if anybody's interested in finding out more, come talk to me afterwards. Also, and after, beyond that, I I brought a whole bunch of of artifacts that I've accumulated. Well, a lot of it came with the house that I purchased. <laughs> But there, there are our plat books from 1912. Uh, there's the St. Thomas Centennial book. Um, thanks to Todd and Peggy Sullivan for a couple of those plat maps, which I'll send back home with you tonight. So don't leave before you get those wherever you are. Maybe they already left. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then there's also a, a, a picture book of, of the, the last 50 years of the St. Thomas sportsman's history. So if you get a chance, come up to the table right up here. Uh, check it out, and if there's, I'll, I'll be around to answer any questions. If anything, does anybody have any questions? Do you have anything to add to that? No, it's a, it's a good organization, and it, it 
was set up for the youth around St. Thomas, so they had some place to go, play ball, and organize. And it, it served them well. I never got that far. It was too far away, and I was holding thistles anyway. Or <laughs> cleaning the barn. Thank you, Mickey. I, uh, I want to thank everybody that helped me. Uh, the O'Connell girls are really into history. Uh, there's two or three of them that are into that. Uh, Bonnie Callahan is as well, and other people are here are really getting into their history, and it's a good thing. Linda told me, Linda O'Connell, that one of her ancestors was a priest, and he looked just like Bing Crosby. By God, I looked it up, and she's right. Now, like in any nationality, they come in all sizes and shapes, and they're not all handsome like Bing. A lot of them might look like me, or Francis Sullivan, or Big Gene. So it's just the way the genetics tumble down, and how you're going to be in your personality, and everybody understands that. Um, I want to have a correction here, as pointed out by Mr. Holitsky. I had it in my notes, but in my haste. Dy Tyrone Township was known as Hillsdale Township. A bunch of Irishmen got together, 16 of them, and one of them was a Doherty. It might have been Hugh Doherty himself, I don't know. They told him to bring lots of whiskey. So they talked it over, there was like 16 of them, and they decided we're going to call it Tyrone, the hell with them people, after where we came from. So hence it was Tyrone Township. Um, go ahead up with a slide and we'll see what we need to talk about. There, those are some of the priests and clergy that were here. Uh, you can see a couple, Father Byrne, Father Howard Holler and part of the gang, Marvin O'Connell that I mentioned, uh, hosted nuns that were here. It was very proud in any religious community to have some of their own become priests, nuns, deacons, and clergymen. So such was true here, such was true throughout the country. That's just a few of them there. Go ahead. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about St. Thomas' the settlement. They had uh, a store and everything. I'll get into that a little bit later. There's some individual slides about that. Keep going. Uh, the churches and social gatherings were very, very important to all religious communities. They got together, they had socials, they worked because they were used to working together, threshing, be what have you. So it was part and an integral part of their religious community, if not their farming community. The ladies all got together and did their thing, uh, helping make the stuff. Come on up with the next. Uh, and they had a huge one out in front of the church, a big picnic. I think this was uh, north of the church. Uh, and you can see a table set up, everybody generally having a good time. So they had a great social network. They didn't roam too far because they couldn't gas up the car and go. They had to make sure the horse was in the mood and took off. Uh, there's a larger one, a two-pager in front of St. Thomas Church. I would estimate there's like about 150 people there. Can you imagine twice that many trying to fit in a little ship and make it across the Atlantic in 30 to 60 days? Not good. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of people buried at St. Thomas. There'll be a little message about that later. Mary Jean does a great job every Memorial Day. I've been there every once in a while. Uh, these are just some of the people at Cashins that were at St. Thomas and some of the businesses that were there. It, it was a thriving community. They had a hardware store. I'll go ahead with the next slide. Uh, they had a dance hall. I think above O'Connell's store was a, uh, a dance hall. The church had a hall itself. At first there was the Coleman's that moved in. After that it passed through a couple hands and uh, the ancestors of O'Connell Oil bought the store. Everybody went to O'Connell's, you know. Jim and Egg uh, ran it, and that's where Dick O'Connell is from and his brother. Uh, go ahead. That's the St. Thomas Hall. 
Uh, and they, they tore that down after a while. They had a problem that was connected with the church, and they were very touchy about drinking too much alcohol there. Uh, and this is a view of St. Thomas from the uh, store, from O'Connell's store down, looking out to the east over the cemetery, which is now O'Connell Oil. Keep going. Uh, I'll get into farming in a bit. These are some of the things that took place. They all worked together, uh, the farmers did. They pooled their resources, uh, they fed one another, and it, it was a very cooperative community, unlike today where somebody runs 3,000 acres and listens to the radio in his tractor. Nothing against him, but that's what has evolved to. Go ahead. Again, this is the store and the hall, and uh, there was a post office there initially. It was quite a, quite a vibrant community for a while. Go ahead. We got that. Okay. Uh -oh. okay, back to that. Okay, keep going. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Callahan connection. It was reported in the book that they came from Maple Plain or somewhere up there. They didn't. Their original homestead was in Tyrone Township, just on the other side of the border. A guy named Dennis Callahan homesteaded it. His wife died after he purchased another 80. He must have got a hold of a relative, John Callahan, that came in from Wisconsin. So he took over the farm, I think in 1877, is what I found out from the company. Uh, that settler ended up dying with a horse accident. There were a lot of accidents on the farm. That was uh, John Callahan of John and Pete that ran the store. He was an entrepreneur. He had Fourth of July parades. He promoted dances and everything else. So he built a current store. His uh, in-laws were from Lesueur. They were Clankies, German. They owned a couple blocks in town and they built a store out of a school that was torn down in Lesueur, his brothers-in-law knew about it. So uh, the man was quite interesting. I had an opportunity to go with Johnny for lunch. He's 91, he still drives a Harley, and he still, uh, he still talks. He's like my dad, Bud, he's still got everything going upstairs. It was quite an interesting, fun afternoon. But what I'm trying to do is figure out my lineage, as I mentioned before. I don't know if we're related or not. But there was a Thomas Callahan that settled right next to where my ancestors were in northern uh, Leeser County. So sometime I'm going to look into and see if this Dennis was related or how they all fit in. I know it wasn't as big as the Kerry Patch, but there might have been two brothers and a couple cousins that came together. So. That part of it's quite interesting indeed. So um, I'm gonna go into early farming. It was tough. I'll tell you a story about planting corn. They had three or four wheels after they had the field prepared, dug and dragged and everything. And they rode over one of the wheels as a marker and they crossed it. So everywhere the wheels crossed, they planted by hand. And some of you had antiques and you went like this. You could hill drop two or three kernels, whatever you wanted by a setting. But they had a whole gang of people planting corn. I don't know how many acres they covered in a day. Today they have 18 and 24 rollers and they could plant 80 acres in less than an hour. But this is how it project. This was the, uh, the Sharkey farm and, uh, in northern Leeser County. Now this is an aerial, somebody must have climbed up on a building. Eddie Sharkey was too young to fly an airplane. So it, it looks down on the threshing and you can see it was quite an operation right around the turn of the century with a lot of help. And I can't imagine being a housewife and feeding that hungry crew, but they did, they did. Keep going down the road. This is the Holleran crew ran by none other than Dennis E. Holleran, his brother Emmett's there. I think I shared this as one of Bruce's daughters and Bruce himself. I had it enhanced. It was about in 1935, 36, like they say, circa. 
there's some cousins that are involved in this thing, but it was a very labor intensive operation, but they did it and they loved it. Keep going. Now we're gonna hear from the church again. I hope not to bore you, but this might be a little interesting. Uh oh. We have to talk about our heritage just a bit. That's why I have the hat on board. It doesn't go on forever, but it talks about the church. And some of it you're going to find interesting. In closing, I would like to thank you for coming today. I want to preserve the memories and all the things that happened in this church. I can remember John Gregory O'Connell himself ringing the bell and rising up with the rope when he was a young altar boy. Before I forget, I can still hear Father Buckley's voice from the commissional saying, you what? <laughs> or Father Foy, just a little late for early mass, clearing his throat before he began speaking in his beautiful Irish voice. Underneath me is a church basement. I can still hear the bingo callers at our annual Thanksgiving turkey bingo. I remember the many card parties held in my basement as well. The many wedding and baby showers and receptions held there also. These are good times when life seems simpler than today. I especially remember the Memorial Day services that Mary Jean Holleran organizes. It makes me feel proud that these services and remembrances continue to this day. So keep the faith, be proud of your heritage, and remember your history, and never let it fade from your memory. Thank you once again, and God bless you all. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Eastern European migration, which took place shortly after this church was built. You get on County Road 32, thank you Art Hay for getting it black top. You start with the Gills, and then you go down and there's the Glasinskis, the Megers, the Soseskis, the Madreskis, the Dorzinskis, the Palowskis, all the way down that road. They called it Little Chicago <laughs> for this reason. A lot of them came up through Chicago and St. Paul and they worked before they got here. In fact, Joe Gill told me, I wish he was here, he's quite a historian. He said they called the earlier two children that were born to Joe Gill city kids because they were born in St. Paul. Their father had to work on the railroad to make enough money to come down here. Because some of the Irish were not raising big families and the farms came up for sale. So they came in and, and did their thing, but a lot of them worked at the railroads or whatever, as a lot of immigrants did. They sponsored one another, they sent word back, and I know somebody I talked to, Karleski, he said his father was sponsored by Paul Mager, and then they brought him in and, and got him set up on a farm. They too were strong in their faith. In 1902, they built a church called St. Joseph, just to the north, but it's south, north, I'll get my directions right, uh, from Lexington. And it was a Polish church, primarily, where a lot of them worshiped. They moved that right over here uh, on the Pioneer Power showgrounds. So it's there today for tours when you come visit. So they have a very unique and interesting history. A lot of them went to that one-room school I mentioned. His grandmother did. The Retkas lived over there. And they had big families as well. So there's a very rich heritage there, and like I mentioned, Barbara Boysen's daughter did a whole history, and it goes way, way back into Poland. It's very, very interesting to see, so you can, uh, you can find out a lot there. So thank you for that. Go ahead, let's see what's next. Oh, look at the eyes, listen to him.
As you can plainly see, I am an old leprechaun. I no longer can walk to the end of the rainbow, and I don't remember where I stashed my last pot of gold. So join me today and celebrate St. Patrick's Day in a very special way. Have a pint or two of your favorite brew. Enjoy friendship and camaraderie on this special day, and have fun listening to the music and singing along, and even dancing if you please. So heist one for me and to your friends. Solanche, Solanche, and a happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. Thank you, we're rounding the corner. There's one or two more slides. I wanted to mention this, this is in New Prague, coming up uh, right before Memorial Day. It's a, a lot about our Iraqi war veterans. I happen to know Keith Deutsch. He told me the story, he was riding in a deuce and a half a truck and he got hit by an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade and lost a leg. He's an interesting fellow and he's not one bit ashamed to tell what happened. There's another one in town that uh, was a Luke's and he was in the Air Force for quite a few years and in some pretty dangerous spots. I think they're both going to be there. So to me, being a veteran myself, it's, it's very interesting to uh, come. If you've got time, come on over. Go ahead, we'll go to the next slide. We've got Memorial Day coming up, and you know the services will be here and there, and uh, that's very important. I speak to you as a veteran and a proud Marine. And uh, like they said, there's some things you can't do. You can't tell an Irishman or a Marine much. <laughs> And I'm both, I make no apologies. Now this is the church finale. This is an invitation to come to Mass, Memorial Day. Dan wanted me to remind you that on May 29th at 0900, in this very church, there will be a Memorial Day service held commemorating those veterans that are buried here in this cemetery. If we have a good day, and I think we will, the congregation will go out into the cemetery as the names of the veterans buried here will be read. So thank you. Hope to see you then. Have a nice day. All right. There's one or two more. Oh. <laughs> That's how I wing my way back from Hawaii on time at a conference. And if you're flying this year, safe travels. And as Sherm Bowen used to say, happy landings. Uh, this is a geological site that I have used in the past. They're closed for the pandemic there in South St. Paul. But they actually have Irish Saturdays, Polish Saturdays, German Saturdays. Uh, if you're interested, give them a call. It's quite interesting. They have genealogists on staff. Uh, and this is the website for the New Prague Historical Society. I want to thank Kirsten and Tim for their technical expertise in helping this thing move smoothly. Uh, this will be up on the site a couple days. It depends on how much time we have, but it'll be up there along with the school's presentation. These little ditties have, to me, have a lot of value. I've got my dad's tractor, I go on for eight minutes about how it was made, where it was made, what it did. Uh, there's another one in there, I've got a Guinness can with two little things on the side, I think uh, Mickey saw it. It talks about how Guinness is made. I've got a talking cow called Amulia Earhart. That's quite interesting how she found the, the hole in Bill Holland's fence and was able to run through and Shep was distracted with the bull. So to me it's interesting and fun. My wife thinks I'm crazy and that's okay. That's all right, I can be crazy. But they have interesting, take the church here. You could have the church talk and then you could have a tour of the church right after with some of the old parishioners and they could talk about the church. And then you could splice that into a DVD 
for Pioneer Power or whatever. So I've got all kinds of ideas running through my head. So if I see something, I think, I think I'm gonna make that talk. The next thing I'm gonna work on is have a pancake talking about the pancake talks. <laughs> and you won't believe what that pancake's gonna say. So thank you, thank you everyone for coming. If anyone has anything they wanna add, please do. I wanna thank everyone for coming and uh, keep up on your history. Remember your history, don't, don't forget it, don't let it slide. It's very important that we not only preserve that, but that we learn from that. We don't just chuck it aside and tear down something because we don't understand it. And watch your kids. All right, thank you.